Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Environment Committee for November 13th, 2018. Um, before I get into the items, if there's anyone who would like to address the committee, if anyone in the audience wants to address the committee, uh, you need to sign in. There's a sheet out on the table outside the door. Uh, we will take time in a, after we finish the formalities here to hear those statements. So if anybody wishes to address the, meet, the committee, there's a place to sign up. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Move so approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda has been approved. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Were there any changes or corrections? Move approval. Okay, second. and we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The minutes have been approved. Uh, seeing nobody, uh, this would be the time I would take comments from the audience. Seeing no one has signed up for that. Okay. We will move on to the business portion of the meeting and Scott was ready to jump right in. Hi, Scott. Gotcha. Item 2018-309. Uh, this has to do with the Minnehaha Park Area Sewer Improvements Real Property Acquisition and Condemnation. Scott, we had- Madam to Chair. Council members, this business item will request council adoption of resolution 27, authorizing the acquisition and use of condemnation for permanent and temporary easement acquisition for the emergency and relief structure for and the 1MN344 tunnel rehabilitation project number 807629. Before you see an image of the project site, I believe you's, all of you have seen this before in a previous business item. It's bounded by Minnehaha, uh, I think it's Parkway, to the north and uh, 52nd Street on the south, and generally runs parallel to Highway 55. Project scope includes a tunnel rehabilitation. We're going to rehabilitate the existing tunnel. And to do that, we need to ha provide safe working place and ventilation of the working area. And that might require the installation of two ventilation shafts. We're going to rehabilitate and convert the regulator R4 structure to an emergency emergency relief structure and we're also rehabilitate two drop shafts one at 50th and one at 52nd street due to hydrogen sulfide corrosion damage also included in the work is uh, cleaning of 1mn 340 interceptor about 2,000 feet of it This map shows the properties impacted by the proposed work. There are nine parcels owned by the Minneapolis Park Board. Um, we'll need temporary and permanent easements. The bulk of this is for um, temporary conveyance and for the, um, the um, improvements to the uh, regulator or emergency overflow structure. And then we need to we require one easement from a private property. It's a Caps Bar. And I think in the item we said we had trouble reaching him. Well, I found out today that we have finally made contact and met and was productive. <laughs> <laughs> This is the proposed construction schedule. 
basically uh, the procurement phase will start in February, <coughs> last to probably around July, and then construction thereafter and terminating in May of 2022. And this, this is our Thrive slide. Basically, uh, Thrive-driven outcomes that pertain to this, this work are stewardship and sustainability, and we're going to efficiently and effectively use council resources. This project also had a great deal of collaboration, involvement with stakeholders and other permitting agencies. And then lastly, I'll restate the, the proposed action, and that is that the council adopt resolution 27, authorizing the acquisition and use of condemnation for permanent and temporary easement acquisition. All four of the emergency relief structure R4 and 1MN344 tunnel rehabilitation project number 807629. Are there any questions? Are there questions for Scott? Scott, you said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the condemnation is a permanent and temporary easements. How how much of it is temporary? Is it... Madam Chair, I don't have the okay. precise figures, but most of it's temporary. And that's to make the transportation and It's for the temporary conveyance, conveyance piping and pumps. All that. Okay, and only one private property is involved. Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay, is there a question from? No, I would just like to make a motion. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Litovsky, we have a motion. Second. And a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's get her done. Opposed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Scott. <clears throat> And I looks like you're going to do the next one, item 2018-310, Full Service Interceptor Engineering Master Contract. Madam Chair, <clears throat> this business item requests authorization for the regional administrator to award and execute five master contracts in the amount of $4 million each, all totaling $20 million, to the following firms, Brown and Caldwell, Bolton and Bank, Stans Tech Consultants, TKDA, and SEH Incorporated. Contracts numbers 18P, 187A, B, C, D, and E. The authorized capital program for the interceptor system, and that includes piping, metering, and lift stations, odor control, work is $660 million. Approximately 240 million of that figure is for interceptor lift station work, meters, and force main improvements. The proposed $20 million for master contracts is necessary to produce bid documents and supplement construction inspection for the interceptor lift station and force main improvements. These activities represent about 8.5% of the estimated capital expenditure. Basically, the contract scope is full service engineering services. That means all disciplines are addressed or the firms are capable of providing those services and it will be utilized in preparation of bid documents for interceptor projects involving lift stations, meters, and force mains. And a, a portion of the value of the contract has been set aside for construction services and this involves shop drawing review for any equipment that's going to be installed to get shop drawings and needs to be reviewed. Requests for information, often contractors have questions about the construction documents and the designer has to address those. And construction inspection. We received 10 pro proposals. The committee re reviewed all 10 each committee member reviewed it individually. Once they were reviewed, they caucused, met maybe two or three times, 
to determine the highest ranked proposals. They recommended awards and contract values as shown here to Brown and Caldwell, Bolton and Mank, Stan Peck Consultants, TKDA and SEH, each for $4 million. These firms were the highest ranked and provided the best directly related experience and expertise. And this is the Thrive outcome slide. And basically this too addresses the outcome of stewardship and sustainability that we efficiently and effectively use council resources. And to summarize the proposed action, uh, we request that the council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute five master contracts at $4 million each, totaling $20 million to the following firms, Brown and Caldwell, Bolton and Bank, Stantec Consultants, TKDA, and SEH Incorporated Contract <coughs> 18P 187A, B, C, D, and E. And if you have questions, I'll gladly answer. Thank you. Council members, questions? Oh, let me, I'll move the motion. Second. Um, I have a question. Of You've got five different engineering firms. How does the work get divided up? I'm... Madam Chair, uh, we make every effort to keep it even. Often we may compete two firms against a particular task. Um, not always. We also try to match the firm's capabilities with the type of work that needs to be performed. Okay. Just curious about that. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is 2018-311, ratification and declaration of emergency for repair at Eagles Point Outfall. Hi, Renee. Welcome. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, members of the Environment Committee, um, my name is Renee Heflin. I am the manager of Plant Engineering Technical Services, and I am here to present business item 2018-311, ratification of declaration of emergency for repair of Eagles Point outfall. Um, just by way of background, the Eagles Point wastewater treatment plant discharges to the Mississippi River at a section known as Bollinger Bend. This is upstream of Lock and Dam 2. The bold white line is the old plant outfall, which has been abandoned and placed. The brown line next to it is the current um, outfall from the Eagles Point plant. It was constructed in 2002. Um, it is a 48 inch HDPE or high density polyethylene pipe. So it's a large plastic pipe. The meandering white and red lines within the um, river channel represent historical and actual barge routes respectively. MCS has a current project um, in the area to replace bedding material under the outfall in coordination with an Army Corps of Engineer project to construct channel improvements at this area. Oh, I, if it's, I was going to draw those on here. Um, the Corps project to install uh, two rock check dams, they're just big boulders uh, dumped in and they direct the flow through the center of the channel. It helps the barge traffic, but there's one approximately here, it looks kind of like a C, and there's also one planned for here. Um, so you can see that one of the rock check dams will cross our outfall structure. And is the is it the Corps of Engineers that are putting in those rocks, or is that us? Uh, yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. The Corps of Engineer has a project. It was actually started a year ago to install two uh, rock check dams. Today, um, our last year, 
they did relocation of muscles and they have installed um, this first one right here. Um, and we, they're getting ready now to install one, um, the second one next year in 2019. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. Okay, technology. On Monday, October uh, 29th, um, our contractor, uh, LS Marine, was out completing a river survey. They were preparing to start work to replace bedding under that section of the outfall where the rock chain would rock training structure would be placed over it. Um, so they were out doing uh, survey, survey work and they observed uh, leakage at an upstream uh, maintenance access uh, structure on the bank and they contacted our construction field office and let them know. On Thursday, November 1st, an, an underwater inspection by the contractor confirmed that significant damage to the outfall, fight, outfall, outfall pipe had occurred. The outfall outlet and about 130 feet of the pipe from the outlet are missing. Um, the next 70 to 80 feet was kinked and pointed in the downstream direction. The notes in this photo are field notes taken by MCS construction staff. The new location of the um, outfall pipe is shown in dark pink here. So you can see it's kind of offset. Um, oh, I'm sure you see it. Uh, right here. This is the uh, about 70 or 80 feet has been kinked and is pointed in the downstream direction. The kinked segment, that 70 or 80 feet, it broke off when the contractor tried to uh, straighten the pipe. The contractor then lifted the end, um, cut it, and covered the end with river mud. This is a close-up of the kink in the pipe. Can you see that? 48 inches. doesn't look like it, but it's right here. And also, this is the uh, end section, a close-up of the end section that was torn. This is that the end of that kink segment. This is not where it broke off. This is um, the 130 feet that was missing. Mm -hmm. um, that's where um, it had torn and had come loose. Bummer. I did it. I left. I left that. Sorry, Susan. <laughs> I think I can still get it. Uh, leakage from the upstream maintenance access structure uh, stopped as soon as the kink had broken loose and the flow through the outfall um, has been restored. Note that the plant treatment capacity and the plant performance were never compromised. We declared an emergency uh, Thursday at the end of the day because the outfall is damaged. The end section is unrestrained. unrestrained. It had concrete anchors every 20 feet. Those at the end are missing. Um, the discharge point is not in its permitted location. You know, this ensures adequate uh, um, mixing so that we meet our effluent permit uh, limits. Immediate repair is necessary because the outfall fought outfall pipe is vulnerable to further damage. It is in a high barge traffic corridor and the um, area is currently under construction by the Corps of Engineers. As I mentioned, they want to get in and install that second rock training structure. Before we can repair anything, we need to confirm the condition of the remaining pipe. Um, this week, we plan to have the inside um, inspected and we also plan to do another uh, river survey that would give us an uh, idea of location and um, in the vicinity, uh, the, the location of the existing pipe, give us more information <clears throat> and then we would be able to design a permanent fix. The work supports the Thrive outcome uh, because it's efficient effective use of resources for um, preservation of infrastructure. Um, the Thrive Outcome of Stewardship 
The emergency declaration in the amount of $6 million is based on the estimated uh, total replacement cost. As I mentioned, uh, we don't know the condition of the pipe, and if we can reuse it, we will. But at this time, we don't know um, what's been torn loose or um, if it's out around or exactly. Um, we would like to verify the condition of that pipe through the total uh, length that's in the river. The proposed uh, action in front of the Environment Committee is that the um, Metropolitan Council ratify the emergency declaration attached to the business item for repair of the outfall <coughs> pipe from the Eagles Point Wastewater Treatment Plant in the amount of $6 million. Thank you, Renee. Uh, Member uh, McCarthy has a question. Yes, I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have a few questions because I, since I cannot see the pipe on my computer. Um, I can't tell, is this pipe um, a flexible pipe? Is it a solid pipe? You said it's a 48-inch um, plastic pipe. But, so I'm wondering, how does something like this have a kink? And also, how old the pipe is? And um, you know, what is the normal lifespan of a pipe? And if kinks are common for this? No, it's quite a few questions there, but I thought it was easier to well. let it all out and you can <laughs> appropriately address it. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member McCarthy, um, first, the HDPE is a rigid pipe. The Corps of Engineer contacted us about a year ago so that we, you know, to try to coordinate the projects with us and we would be able to evaluate the pipe. So we inspected it at that time. Um, it seemed okay in our consulting. Um, engineer Black and Beach uh, determined that the pipe uh, bedding material needed to be replaced. So the pipe was strong enough to withstand the boulder uh, rock training uh, structure on top of it, but it needed the bedding replaced. So it's a pretty strong um, rigid pipe. Um, also, uh, it, it's, it's about two feet buried um, uh, at the time, but it shows a minimum, excuse me, uh, Madam Chair, it's a minimum three feet uh, buried in the river, so that depth uh, probably changes. I'm, I'm not sure how um, the pipe was damaged. Uh, what we do know is that it's not normal wear and tear. I believe the uh, life cycle, the uh, service life of those pipes has to be around 80 to 100 years. I want Scott Dentz to correct me. Um, but usually, usually when we install pipes, it's 80 to 100 years. And then there was another question. Um, Council Member McCarthy, I think you had a... How, how old our pipe was? How old are our current... Oh, pipe? thank you. Um, the Eagles Point uh, outfall, the new outfall, was actually constructed in 2002. So that would make it about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. It's a teenager. Council Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So the pipe is almost a teenager. Sixteen. Um, right. Acting up. Um, do we have any idea how the damage happened? It wasn't uh, the contractor or the construction that the Corps was doing? Madam Chair, Council Member Latovsky, I would not want to speculate. Um, I can just say that it was a um, a tear a, a, um, and not wear. Hmm. That would be, you know, that, that I'd piggyback on that question. When I look at the red line where the actual channel is, it seems to come awfully close to your outfall. Was that thought about when they positioned the outfall? or? Um, Madam Chair, I did review the facility plan for uh, cost estimates and the value of that pipe, and there uh, were some uh, fancy hydraulic modeling of um, barge uh, velocities and uh, forces on the end of the pipe to make sure that it could withstand that, not a hit. If you would notice that new outfall, the brown, line is shorter than the abandoned pipe, so it was pulled out of the barge traffic somewhat. I can also state that the buoys on here, it says that the core um, 
annually dredges this section of the bend so that the tows are for the barge traffic and uh, there's an area that's buoyed off. That's also a note on here and that we are outside of the buoyed path mm -hmm. of the barges. So when they put this new rock wall or dam in, will that further protect the outfall? Um, Madam Where Chair. Where you drew it originally. Um, um, Madam Chair, I can tell you that there are three purposes or three outcome, three results cited by the Corps of Engineer, Corps of Engineers, and that is um, a reduced cost for the large companies because they would be able to, for the rock training structures, that is reduced cost for the barge companies because they would be able to tow more barges, mm -hmm. uh, 12 to 15 rather than six mm -hmm. or some number less than 10 that they mentioned. Um, they said uh, uh, reduced cost for the um, assisting agencies like the ones who maintain the buoys or mm -hmm. that it would be reduced cost for them. And uh, for the core, it would be um, increased maintenance so the purpose is really to help the barge traffic through this very tight uh, bend. It's, it's not a straight channel. And mm -hmm. um, discussions with the Corps mentioned that um, they receive complaints or comments from the barge companies that this is, a, this is difficult to uh, navigate. But my question is, would it also be an assist to the, the performance of the outfall, having these rocks in place and the, keep the barges away from the outfall pipe? Madam Chair, I would um, possibly, uh, we have some engineers that uh, think it uh, could protect the outfall, but I think the outfall outlet needs to be on the other side uh -huh. of the rock training structure so that it can get the channel mixing of the velocities. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think once it's outside of the rock training structure, that it's um, unprotected. I did uh, show, or hopefully um, I showed on the uh, slide there that um, this would not necessarily protect the um, outlet against barges. You know, those are big boats, but the outlet has, a, it, there's a design to it. You know, it's uh, this outlet uh, came out of the, the bank and uh, turned up. There's a design to it to try to maximize the, uh, maximize mixing and you'll see the concrete collars here that help with the restraint and also on the end is the armory riprap you know to try to keep all of the uh, uh, river muck you know uh, away or to keep that thing from uh, moving around so there is a, a there is a design and I uh, think that the Next one would probably be similar. There might be something we could beef up uh, the end, but it, it needs to get out in the, the mixing flow. Sounds good. So the proposed action is that we ratify the emergency declaration attached to the business item for repair of the outfall pipe from the East, the Eagles Point wastewater treatment plant in the amount of $6 million. Do I have a motion? Or are there other comments? I'll move the action. Sure. Yeah, we have a motion second. and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thanks, Renee. We put you through the ringer there. <laughs> the next item, 2018 312, is a request for a public hearing on the acquisition of the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant. And Janine's going to walk us through this. Madam Welcome Chair, members of the Council, uh, tonight we're asking you to, to um, authorize a public hearing for the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant acquisition. Um, some background, the Thrive Minnesota 20, um, excuse me, the Thrive Minneapolis-St. Paul 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan 
states that wastewater treatment plants or acquisition of wastewater treatment plants from suburban communities outside the current service area based upon requests through the comprehensive plan and comprehensive sewer plan process after soliciting customer input and conducting a public hearing on the request. So the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant acquisition was identified in the Thrive 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan and was also identified in the City of Rogers Wastewater Treatment, or excuse me, the City of Rogers Comprehensive Plan. So again, um, the background, the, the acquisition of the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant was contemplated in their 2030 Comprehensive Plan and this amendment was approved by the Council in 2016. The acquisition of the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant was contemplated in the 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan on, on page 47, and that was approved by the Council in 2014. And then this, um, just a few weeks ago, the City of Rogers City Council formally requested acquisition of the uh, Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant by resolution on October 23rd, and that was transmitted to me by the City Clerk of the City of Rogers. So here is the Rogers uh, service area. Um, first of all, on this map, you'll see that the city of Rogers is bisected by um, Interstate I-94. The water, Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant is west of County Road 101. And when it was built in 1960 and commissioned in 1960, it was north of town and outside of their development area. And now it's really considered part of their downtown. Mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons that they would they wish for the council to acquire the plant. The, um, the 2017 average annual average flow of the existing plant is 0.87 MGD, and the existing plant discharges through a wetland to the Crow River. The future Crow River plant would be constructed on property owned by the council located south of I-94 near County Road 144, and Territorial Road, which is County Road 116. The council owns about 38 acres of, on the south side of County Road 144 with an additional 59 acres to the north. Uh, the council's 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan anticipated construction of a plant in Rogers with plan capacity of 3 MGD for 2040, which would serve a projected growth in the Rogers service area of approximately 18,000 people. The long-term plan capacity for this plant would be 6 MGD. So the Thrive Outcomes is um, stewardship. Uh, the, the, um, the wastewater treatment in the region protects water resources and public health. Prosperity, the, the regional wastewater system um, exists and does foster the economic growth of the region. And then the principles of collaboration are clearly identified. Um, council staff has been working with the City of Rogers on this possible acquisition since 2004. It's been a long, long time. Um, the recession had a lot to do with uh, kind of a slowdown of their desire to, to have us acquire their plant. But now with growth um, continuing and the Elm Creek Interceptor having limited capacity to serve uh, the Northwest Hennepin County area, it has now become apparent that it is important for us to proceed with the acquisition. Oops, excuse me. So the key dates for the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant acquisition include um, authorization of a public hearing. Um, if, if approved tonight, it would go on to the city count, or excuse me, to the council, full council, uh, the 28th of uh, November. We would hold the public hearing uh, mid to late January of 2019 and uh, after that public hearing and consideration of the comments, we would ask the council to consider authorization of an acquisition and wastewater service agreement with the city of Rogers. We anticipate that that would be available uh, February of 2019, followed up by the Metropolitan Council um, shortly thereafter. So the action before the council tonight is that the Metropolitan Council authorize a public hearing to gather public input on the proposed acquisition of the Rogers Wastewater Treatment Plant. Thank you, Janine. Any questions? Councilman Rutowski. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, maybe I'm just being really dense, but what do we do with it once we get it? 
Madam Chair, members of the council, we plan to operate it um, until about 20, uh, until about 20, or 2029, excuse me. And then we would, um, and that is something that we've done in the 70s, we operated acquired plants and operated them. And then typically what we would do is phase that plant out and then build the new facility um, as identified in the council action. And then that property that is currently the site of the Rogers plant would most likely become a lift station to convey the wastewater that's going to that site by gravity. And we would convey that then, then to the new plant site. Councilmember And so why does it matter if we own it and run it or they own it and run it? Why is it, why, how, how is that benefiting them? Madam Chair, members of the council, um, they have a couple of drivers. Uh, first of all, uh, they, they um, benefit because it's a regional cost of service as opposed to them paying individually for their wastewater treatment plant. The region works together to assess their costs across the region. Um, secondly, we know that they are, um, they will be facing issues with capacity. And then finally, they have some permit requirements that they believe that they will not be able to meet with their existing facilities. So we're regionalizing the costs. That, that's been so the premise everybody of- Everybody else is paying for something that they used to pay for on their own. That is correct. I mean, that is really, truly the premise of the um, wastewater system in general is that we have regionalized the cost. Um, I looked up our last treatment plant that we acquired was the Waconia wastewater treatment plant, and that was in 1975. But in the 70s, we, we, um, we acquired many 33 plants in total and now have consolidated them into eight wastewater treatment plants. Sorry. Sorry, I guess mm -hmm. my phone is ringing back here. Um, I think if I can re remember the question. So it will just be servicing Rogers until for the next 10 years? Um, it will be servicing Rogers for the next 10 years. Um, in addition, Port, but the, the, Crow, the new Crow River plant will also serve uh, Corcoran and Dayton. And, and when there is will... that due to be built? Pardon me? When is that due to be built? 2029 to be commissioned in 2030. And then um, furthermore, we should indicate that we have built the Elm Creek Interceptor, which will um, be conveying wastewater from the southern part of Rog uh, Rogers to the regional wastewater system. And that, um, that, that wastewater is treated in St. Paul by the Metro plant. Other questions or concerns? So the motion is to uh, authorize a public hearing. Move approval. We have a motion. I'll second it. And a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Janine. The motion has been approved. I know. And uh, now we will move to the information portion of the meeting. And this is a discussion of the Towerside Sewer Thermal Energy Recovery Potential Project. And Deborah Manning is going to join Janine. And I'm going to turn the discussion over to you. Madam Chair, members of the council, um, let's see. We are here to, uh, to discuss the, uh, the proposal that we received from Evergreen Energy. Excuse me, let, let me go back a slide to um, for the Towerside Sewage Thermal Energy Recovery Project. Um, MCS has been reviewing the sewer, sewage thermal energy recovery proposal from, for quite some time. We have conducted our review within the framework of Thrive and the 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan, which includes a statement regarding the operations of the regional wastewater system in a sustainable manner. Give me just a moment to get organized here. Um, the 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan on page 92 talks about uh, operating the regional wastewater system in a way that um, includes energy conservation and energy generation. And some of the ideas that it identifies is generating energy from processing biosolids, such as uh, our work at Blue Lake or at the Metro plant, recovering heat from plant effluent, solar power generation facilities, 
pursue additional technologies such as fuel cells as capabilities and economics are proven and improve the operational sustainability of the regional wastewater system when feasible. So um, while members of the council know where the council gets its revenue to operate the regional wastewater system, not everyone that has been interested in this proposal um, has a clear understanding of our revenue sources. And as this uh, chart shows you before you, um, our municipal wastewater charge, which comes from the 109 cities that we serve, uh, could, comprises 77% of the revenue that we receive to operate the regional wastewater system. An additional 15% comes from the sewer availability charge, uh, which also comes from local communities who collect it from the developers who are, who are um, expanding their businesses in their areas, in their communities. So effectively, 92% of the revenue to operate the regional wastewater system is collected by our 109 communities. As council knows, this is why it's important that we operate this system in alignment with our statutory mission, our policy plan, and our agreed upon customer level of service. When we do, we tend to get um, customer support on tough issues that we need to tackle together, such as I&I, implementation of our capital program, planning for regional growth, and regulatory compliance issues. When we deviate from our mission, our policy plan, and our, or our statutory authority, our customer communities tend to object um, as they feel quite invested in the efficient operation of our wastewater system. So with the backdrop of our 2040 Water Resources Policy Plan, our statutory authority, and our customer level of service, we reviewed the Towerside Sewage Thermal Energy Recovery Proposal. Um, before Deborah gets to the review, and I think I'm going to skip over this slide, before Deborah gets to the review of the actual proposal, she will walk through the steps that MCS is taking to meet the goals for operating the regional wastewater system in a sustainable way. And then she will transition to a technical review of the STIR proposal. And then I will wrap up um, our presentation with some concluding remarks. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, the progress towards MCS's energy goals really falls into a few kind of chunks of time. Um, the first is from the 1990s to about 2011. We really focused on reducing energy uh, use in areas where it was clear in the industry um, where energy is mostly used in wastewater. And that's in aeration and in biosolids processing. So we knew to focus there and we did in that time frame. In 2012 to 2014, we realized we needed, and, and at the urging of the council, uh, we needed to create, and we did, uh, sustainable sustainability policies and programs. And so that was um, implemented in that time frame. And then um, since then, we've been implementing many capital improvement um, projects and also uh, engaging in some partnerships. And I um, want to mention that a lot of what I'll mention is capital improvements, but um, our operations staff is also implementing energy improvement um, projects as well. In the future, we really do see um, new opportunities, as uh, Janine was talking about, um, the Crow River Wastewater Treatment Plant. We believe that there'll be opportunities to uh, implement um, sustainability energy uh, uh, type projects from the get-go, which is much more cost-effective than um, retrofitting. I want to run through just a few um, examples uh, of partnerships and collaborations um, that we've received um, since about that 2014 timeframe. And they're shown on this slide. And I should mention there was a handout, 11 by 17 handout, that provides a lot more information, more detail than um, I will go through go through in this presentation, but we'll be happy to answer questions about that. So this lists uh, a number of the partnerships and awards that we've received since that 2012-2014 um, time frame. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention um, a few examples um, in these areas of focus that our policy document set out. And the first is in generating energy from processing biosolids. 
Uh, the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant since 1979 has been using biogas for process and building heat. So we've been recovering heat from that, uh, using that biogas or producing heat using biogas, producing energy. And at the metro plant, as you're aware, we have these fluidized bed incinerators and we generate quite a bit of, um, of energy there from the, quite a bit of heat that we generate. And we save about $2.5 million per year um, using that energy for heating uh, buildings at the plant. In the future, uh, we plan to install at the Empire plant a biogas combined heat and power project. And this will use biogas from solids processing to generate about 30% of the Empire's uh, heat power needs, saving about $350,000 per year. We'll also upgrade the, um, uh, the, the boilers there, the high efficiency boilers. At Eagles Point, the, another area that uh, Janine ran through in the beginning was recovering heat from plant effluent. Since 2004, at the Eagles Point wastewater treatment plant, we have been recovering uh, heat from our effluent and using it to heat the administration building. And it was kind of a pilot test um, at that time. Uh, we wanted to learn more about heat recovery. And uh, what we found is that the equipment is actually relatively issue free when used on that plant effluent. So there's um, little solids or things like that um, to plug up the system. And in 2019, we'll be installing some monitoring equipment so we can determine more uh, the energy savings. We recover heat from plant effluent, um, as I mentioned, at, at Eagles Point. But we've looked at, uh, most recently, we've done a study of where else we might uh, do that. And what that study found is that if we're retrofitting our heat equipment as part of what would need to be done, it's not really cost effective. But if it's new equipment, uh, we have a higher chance of it being cost effective. And so we would be looking at those new treatment plants um, as, as opportunities to recover heat from the effluent. Another area is solar power generation. Uh, so we've been making a lot of progress here. 2017 at Blue Lake, we completed a behind the meter solar installation as well as a council sited community solar garden. And we um, completed uh, council sited solar community solar gardens at Empire and the Seneca Ash landfill as well. Um, we should note that we're also, uh, we have been subscribing to community solar gardens that are not on our site. And we project that 80% of, of our projected energy savings from solar will come from subscriptions. We've also been pursuing additional technologies as capabilities and economics are proven. In our aeration basin, as mentioned at the beginning, that's an area of high um, energy use. We've uh, completed dissolved oxygen control projects, improving that, enhanced diffuser cleaning, high pr um, header pressure reduction. We basically are implementing what we uh, identify as proven technology, cost effective to install and moving along with that. We've also at Metro Plant uh, installed some high energy, high efficiency lighting improvements. And you can tell between the second and third slides there what a difference this makes. Um, in the, in the um, tunnels at the metro plant once we've upgraded that lighting. We continue to look at ways to uh, improve our energy uh, reduction and meet our goals. And one of these, we, we believe, is the industrial pretreatment incentive program, which we think will actually um, change the characteristics of our treatment processes themselves. Um, for example, at the Empire uh, Treatment Plant, we recently completed an agreement with Kemp's to receive their high strength waste from their dairy um, processing and uh, receive that directly into our digesters. And uh, we will be able to produce more biogas that way, which we've been mentioning we use for uh, process and building heating. And we believe we will um, increase that biogas production by 23% that would enable us to um, decrease our energy use for heating 
um, by about, well, the equivalent of about 172 cars per year. Um, so we'll also be able to take some trucks traffic off the road. So we're, that's, you know, that's not equipment per se, but a different way of, of running our system. So there's kind of the so what. Um, we've done these projects. What has the impact been? We've been tracking our greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction, and this graph shows from 2005 through 2017 uh, how the progress has been going. A number of different um, colored bands there. The green is electricity. The blue, the light blue is metro sludge incineration. The orange is effluent discharge. Uh, the dark blue is natural gas. The light orange is Seneca uh, sludge incineration. And the gray is nitrification, denitrification. So these are all um, areas that we track in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and reductions. Um, the other items shown on this graph are the, um, the uh, 2030 state policy goal for energy reduction, which um, was about that 30% reduction, which we have already met. And then the 2050 reduction goal is shown in the, the darker band there. And we're well on our way to meeting that goal as well. I do want to mention that um, we look at ourselves in comparison with um, other sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And this graph um, represents that, some of that information. Uh, we are kind of in that orange band in the middle. Um, these are areas of, that the state uses uh, to um, track greenhouse gas emissions and sources. And the, the green is the electrical production. Uh, the light blue is transportation. Like I said, the orange is waste, which includes wastewater treatment plants, but also landfills. The dark blue is agriculture, and the orange is industrial and residential, uh, kind of gray and commercial at the top. So uh, across the state, that's the um, bar on the left. Uh, the orange there in the middle is all the wastewater treatment plants, landfills. Kind of a, a small component there in, in the region is shown on the right. And I think these are yeah, 2010 numbers. And so we're, we're a small contributor there. But that doesn't exclude us from working on greenhouse gas emissions. It just puts it in context. So, Deborah, I'm, I just want to make sure I understand. That's that narrow orange line in both graphs. That's the greenhouse gas from wastewater treatment plants. And landfills. And right. landfills. So it's mm -hmm. really quite small. In comparison. In comparison. OK. Right. Interesting. Right. I would have thought it would be worse. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So that is the portion of the presentation that talks about um, our uh, progress towards our energy goals. I want to shift to the Towerside Sewage Thermal Energy Recovery proposed project. And um, we've got a little timeline represented here of uh, about three years ago, uh, we received the inquiry from Edward Green Energy about their potential STIR uh, application on an MCS interceptor. And from 2015 to about 2017, we continued to have discussions with Edward Green Energy about the feasibility of of that application. In December of 2017, uh, Janine and Larry Rogacki made a presentation to the Environment Committee about some of the findings from those um, uh, conversations. And there was a decision to continue the feasibility, um, in exploring the feasibility. Um, in June uh, through August, uh, we did a technical review of some information, project information that Evergreen Energy provided. They had uh, what they call their, their project model, and we had an opportunity to look at that and um, also have some conversations with them about it. In October, we met with Evergreen Energy, presented our final comments about that technical review, and now we're reporting to the Environment Committee. The proposed concept is shown here in an aerial, and I also have a, a schematic. Uh, so the concept would be to take, to divert uh, wastewater, about 2.6 million gallons a day, from the interceptor that runs down the rail line to Oak Street, uh, right in front of TCF Bank Stadium, 
and uh, send that untreated wastewater to a wet well and pump station through a 14 inch pipe. Um, the wastewater would then be pumped to an energy center where there would be energy transfer equipment, um, heat transfer really equipment, um, transferring heat from the wastewater to a, a water loop, essentially a fresh water loop, uh, which would then go on to the proposed um, days in and for use for heating and cooling. Uh, the wastewater would that went to that energy center would be returned to the interceptor through another 14 inch pipe. The uh, system would do both heating and cooling in the summer. It would be used for cooling. The um, heat from the air conditioning would be transferred to the wastewater. In the winter, the heat from the wastewater would be transferred to the, um, the loop for heating. This schematic is just shows that loop. It's a little difficult to tell sometimes from the aerial what's going on. Um, it just shows the orange lines there, the wastewater coming and going to that energy center through the lift station, and then that uh, closed uh, water loop uh, coming and going from the, the dates in. There were a number of issues that we looked at in our technical uh, review. One of them was regulatory compliance. We met with the MPCA about how this sort of um, installation would be uh, regulated. It is a new um, application for them, um, but they also said that a permit would be required and that um, MCS must retain control and responsibility for the wastewater and the interceptor system at all times, and uh, that that responsibility couldn't be transferred. They asked, you know, can we do a handoff? And the and answer was no, it needs to be within our control the whole time. We concluded from that that MCS must retain ownership and operation of STIRS wastewater-related facilities. Uh, then we took a look at um, what is a 2.6 million gallon a day uh, lift station uh, like in our system. We tried to find one that would be comparable. Uh, there is a lift station in Lakeville of similar capacity, 2.5 MGD. It also has um, a number of depth and piping similarities, so we felt that this was at least a, a good comparison to start with thinking through. This is a um, profile of the construction drawings, and really the reason to show this is just the um, scale of the depth of the facility, which we estimate would need to be about 40 feet deep. And that little blue figure on the left is there for scale in terms of a person standing there in the wet well. I don't know why they would do that. <laughs> um, that's, that's how deep they would. Uh, as we went along, we also wanted to look at construction issues. Um, it, it, you know, we were trying to get to the point of being able to do a cost estimate for the facility, the, the lift station in particular. And pipe. We had done a uh, a project in this very area when the TCF Bank Stadium was being constructed and the biomedical um, campus was being constructed at the U. And these are some uh, construction photos from that project and right at the location of where this diversion would, uh, would occur. And the, the photo on the left represents just a, a fraction of the utilities that are in this area and some of the interferences that we need to work through and the figure on the right, the photo on the right, um, indicates the depth of construction uh, to, to construct this uh, facility and the, the diversion of this area and, and the lift station. And I want to point out that this was construction that was actually um, during a time when construction was fairly easy. Everything was torn up. There wasn't a stadium there. Um, there was the possibility to do open cut construction. We don't anticipate we would be able to do construction that way, that we would need sheeting and shoring and more expensive um, construction. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch. You would need what? Sheeting and shoring. OK, I, I, can I got it. Thank you. So uh, as we were considering all this, we had looked at Evergreen Energy's um, construction cost estimate, which was approximately $1 million, as uh, we saw uh, reviewed in their model and talked to them about 
and our construction estimate um, was about seven to thirteen million dollars. So we really saw a, a, a difference there. Um, our assessment is some of the major differences that that we think uh, between our estimate and theirs are some of the items listed here. Won't go through all of them. Things like the utility complex, um, odor control equipment, uh, temporary diversion of wastewater, site dewatering, uh, traffic control. So. We do think those are some sizable costs. Another issue that we took time to look into uh, was performance information. Uh, we did find a lack of proven successful stir performance on untreated wastewater. Uh, we uh, identified and, and were referred um, by Evergreen Energy to two facilities, two locations where stir facilities were either installed or pilot tested. One of those is in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, in the southeast False Creek neighborhood, where a stir type installation is installed again on, uh, on untreated wastewater. Um, these are some of the um, items that we think were uh, associated with that um, installation. The drivers were really a commitment uh, by the local city, city really to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what they have found, uh, this is information, we, we made a number of phone calls to uh, the wastewater utility and the city and also read reports that they made available. Their current rate for um, energy from the stir facility is about 23% higher than uh, compared with natural gas systems. We also contacted Camden, New Jersey um, where a stir type equipment was pilot tested um, at their wastewater treatment plant on their untreated wastewater and uh, found that, in, in their words, that the um, pilot test really was not successful due to a lot of clogging of the equipment. They couldn't keep the equipment running for more than two or three weeks um, before it would clog again. And they estimated their return on investment to be about 35 plus years. So they didn't feel on raw wastewater um, that that was a, the, the best type of situation. But they um, have said that they are looking at maybe per, per, um, proceeding with testing it um, in their wastewater plant downstream of their screening. We looked at um, if we scaled up, if we had these stereotype facilities uh, more than one in our wastewater um, collection system, what impact would it ha um, potentially have? And uh, that isn't what Evergreen Energy has proposed. They've proposed one, but we need to look at, if we do this one, uh, people are interested in doing more, um, what impact might that have? So we looked at uh, if our wastewater temperature to the metro plant was reduced from 12 degrees centigrade to 11 degrees centigrade, so a one degree change. Again, that's not what Evergreen Energy's proposed project would result in, um, but we were looking at if this was scaled up, we took one degree change. With our existing permit, a one degree change would uh, mean that we would need to build three additional aeration tanks at a cost of about 50 million. That's due to our nutrient reduction process there that would be impacted by the decrease in temperature. We do anticipate um, further reductions in our nutrient reduction level, the new permits. And um, under those anticipated permit um, conditions, we would anticipate needing five additional aeration tanks at a cost of about $100 million. Those are capital costs. There would be operational costs associated with it as well. Finally, and maybe more important, we do have uh, our uh, MCS energy goals and believe that this would impact our ability to do, say, heat recovery on our plant effluent and meet our energy goals that we have in place. This third slide really is, oh, thank you. Um, it's not the third slide, it is a slide showing three different <laughs> alternatives of where we might locate um, uh, thermal energy recovery installations. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to say uh, we can, we're looked at in the um, raw wastewater in the collection system, 
on the influent to our wastewater treatment plant or at, on our effluent. We really believe the effluent heat recovery is really shows the most promise, both in terms of um, public health protection, uh, risk, uh, construction, uh, feasibility, um, but also the most benefit to the regional system, and that is very important to our customers. So, Madam Chair, um, I think some of you may have seen this uh, summary uh, slide in the past, but what we did was review, take all of our comments and put them in uh, one summary document. And Deborah has basically identified and ran through everything on the lower um, uh, two-thirds of the page. But on the top of the page is the authority. Um, we have reviewed this proposal with our Office of General Counsel, and uh, they have indicated that unless it has expressed legislative authority, a government cannot compete with private business. The recommendation is the council not proceed with, with STIR, or sewage thermal energy recovery, and that would benefit a private entity. Again, we have the authority to, to uh, recover heat for our own purposes, but to benefit a private entity without express legislative authority. We would, in effect, be competing with private businesses that provide energy to um, private customers. Um, secondly, that the council has no policy about wastewater heat value transfer or sale. Again, I, I talked um, earlier in the presentation about our policies on a, on a sustainable regional wastewater system, and it did identify energy recovery, but again, it was to benefit the regional wastewater system. And then finally, we have um, reviewed this proposal with our director of risk management who has indicated that the council would face an increased risk, both directly and indirectly, associated with wastewater-related STIR facilities. There is no guarantee that the council could be satisfactorily insured or indemnified by the STIR operator, and the council ownership of those facilities would be required, as was indicated by the MPCA's review. And the other items on this um, summary I have already been uh, covered by Deborah in her presentation. So as, um, as a wrap up, um, the, the mission of our organization is to provide wastewater services and integrated planning to ensure sustainable water quality and water supply for the region. Uh, we do this in a way that's consistent with customer support for efforts focused on our mission our ongoing new initiatives that support the mission and benefit the regional wastewater system require council staff and leadership resources. Um, for example, the INI program is something that we have been working on since 2003, and that's an example of a new initiative back in 2003 that has required quite, a, quite an investment on the part of the council but has reaped benefits to the regional wastewater system. And then the policy supports the MCS in pursuing additional energy recovery technologies as capabilities and economics are proven and are for the benefit of the regional wastewater system. Um, the MCS review of Towerside STIR proposal preferred, performed with this mission and policy in mind, and we believe we did a thorough and fair assessment of the proposal. And our finding is that the Evergreen Energy proposed project is inconsistent with MCS's mission and policy. So our next steps are to conclude the review and further discussions with uh, regarding participation in the Evergreen Energy's potential project, and then continue to investigate and implement potential energy recovery from wastewater for the benefit of the Council's wastewater facilities. Um, that concludes your presentation. Yes. Thank you, Janine and, and Deborah. Council members, questions, comments? Oh, yeah. Council member Lutowski. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I'll start. I have a lot, actually, but I won't say all of them, but it's hard to keep track. Um, I appreciate um, the presentation, and I appreciate that uh, it was delayed until uh, an opportunity where I could be here. I've been a little involved with this, and it's in my district, and obviously have relationships with some of the stakeholders who have written all of us letters today. Um, I don't know if everybody in the audience is aware. We have um, three or four letters here from people at the University of Minnesota, people involved with um, 
the Tower Site Innovation District, a uh, couple of council members from Minneapolis. Um, I got one from the council member in St. Paul. I don't know if that's in here too. Um, and, you know, they talk about um, the benefits of doing a project like this, which I don't really need to get into, but, you know, we have a climate change um, issue in our country and we have to kind of do everything we can to uh, find ways to lower emissions. And, and this is one um, uh, pilot idea um, that uh, I think people have um, some sense that it, it could have some promise to explore. Um, so while I appreciate that, I also would encourage us to continue um, what's called the collaborative exploration process, which somebody put in their letter, which I really like that idea of an approach. Um, one of the letters lays out um, the, the re response to this presentation and where there are some misunderstandings or some um, ways that it could be approached differently. Um, and so I, I would really encourage us to have a more collaborative approach that, that might get to know. It might result in a no, but at least hear each other out until um, all those concerns are kind of at the table. Um, I also want to draw attention to one particular letter because I, I, I like this, the way that this was um, addressed. This is the letter from Sarah Harris, who's the managing director of the University of Minnesota Foundation Real Estate Advisors, and uh, Tom Fisher, who is the director of the Minnesota Design Center at the University of Minnesota, um, where they say, we understand that there are concerns about functionality. They recognize that. They say, we understand that there are concerns about resources. They recognize that. We understand that there are concerns about policy. They recognize that. But they're asking us to be partners with them as they work through some of these issues. Council Member Wolf, did you raise your hand? Or? I did not. I, I mean, I can comment. <laughs> If you like, <laughs> I, I think the staff was very thorough with their uh, analysis of this, and, and I understand the frustration of the people who want to do this, but I think it's important for us to look for the best bang for our buck, and that heat has a value to us in energy recovery. And if the most efficient way to use that is after the effluent is coming out of our plants, then we kind of owe it to our customers to go for the most effective place to get that energy out. I, I understand the desire, but that's a really tough spot to do a project. And there's a whole bunch of brand new construction there that would have to be torn up in order to do this. I, I mean, it, the, the one place that they did do it, it's costing much more than other sources of, of energy. And I guess I don't understand where those dollars would come from to get, get energy that costs more and put more risk on us. The, the, the idea that we can't put the risk on them legally is very problematic for us. I mean, if they wanted to cover all of the costs and all of the problems and everything, that's one thing, but we need to use that energy for all of our customers in the most cost-effective manner that we can. Other comments? I um, I recognize that there are a lot of challenges with this, but I also recognize that I feel like the conversation between um, the council and the project team is not over yet, right? It, you guys might want to just say no, but we're, have, we have somebody out there who wants to be a partner with us, and it would um, I would just encourage us to let that uh, negotiation and that conversation go a little bit further, especially now that we've got um, the cities kind of weighing in and asking us to be partners on these things. Uh, and I have a feeling that they're going to be going to the legislature that might uh, open up doors or open up complications for us. Well, innovation is certainly uh, the name of the game right now, isn't it? That um... And when we first got on the council, I remember 
as we struggled through some of our policy things, whether it was sustainability or energy or, or what. Um, I think this council as a whole really appreciates the, the desires the Evergreen Energy and the STIR project represent. I, as I read the letters from the city council and the mayors and stuff, it became clear to me that there are other areas, both in Minneapolis and I think in St. Paul, that um, are, are aiming for similar types of innovation, energy reduction. And so the new information for me today is what impact that would have on our system. You know, can you just do it for one, you know, entity? And then these other, well, people start to come online and then we have to invest in aeration or whatever. Um, I think, um, I think that, that concerns me a great deal that uh, we're, we still have use for the heat that's in the effluent for our own system. Oh. But I, I just have concerns about diverting that resource that's ours and that we've been maintaining. Um, not that these aren't good ideas and uh, that the, who knows where the technology will lead us. Uh, the implications for me in, in your presentation that it would be very expensive if we started having two or three other innovative districts. There's one in St. Paul, and I think there are at least two more in Minneapolis that are coming up, whether or not they'll come and ask, make the same ask. But it, it starts putting us in a position where, um, I don't know, it seems to me we're giving away something we should be using and I appreciate that. I, I'm very impressed with the graph that uh, shows that we're down to the the 2030 mark already. It's only 2018, and that uh, if we continue with our own customers and our own facilities to reduce our energy, um, we, we're meeting the same goals that that Evergreen is trying to meet, but we're doing it in a cost-effective. Uh, systematic way that fits our system rather than, you know, I, I remember uh, one of the big business gurus said, you know, stick to your own business, don't start, you know, and the companies that started to diversify too widely often ran into trouble. You know, it seems to me we have a lot on our plate to handle right now. And I, I don't know, I, I, I just... We've been in this conversation for three years. I think that uh, unless there was some remarkably new information, I'm not too sure that I see the, the potential to go further at this point. I mean, there might be some big thing on the horizon that I don't know anything about, but I certainly appreciate what they're trying to do. Council Member Wolf. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's very well said, and I agree with you. I appreciate what they're trying to do. It just doesn't seem to be the right fit right now. I mean, if they want to go pursue legislation to make things possible, if technical things, if there's technical advances and things that change over time, those are all things to be considered. But with the technology that we have today and the state laws that we have today, we can't really justify spending council resources lobbying the legislature or doing all these other things that would need to happen to make that feasible because right now it, it really isn't in our best interest to, to do that. And I would respectfully disagree. It does meet several things that are mentioned in Thrive in terms of partnership, in terms of reusing um, resources um, again, like we don't have an action in front of us either, so I'm not quite sure um, what the result is, but I hope a, a door can remain open for uh, continued conversation. Apparently there is somebody in the audience, and I don't know if that person wants to. No, we had an be... opportunity before. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that, but I don't. Um, 
I don't think the conversation is going to end, and so I hope that uh, staff can keep their um, eyes open a little bit. Did you have a comment? I'll just add our, you know, the closing statement that Janine had is we're going to be looking very closely at the technology around sewage thermal. It's our answer is yes, it is a good thing to um, reduce carbon emissions, and so we have common ground. But right now, the feasibility looks way better for us to focus within our system to do that, and that's primarily where we're going to be. But if something changes in the future, then certainly we could re-entertain a look at this. But at, at this point, it, it really does look like the, the most uh, productive way for us to go about this would be within our system. And respecting that. The other piece is you've heard me talk about one water and the challenges we have on one water and the, the complexity of the problems because we have all these multiple systems that play into the water picture. And I think that we see a lot of need for us to put our energy and efforts towards that in this very near future. And we see changes going on with our flow because of redus our, our flow, people putting in higher efficiency, uh, addressing I and I, which are all good things, but it changes the, the flow that we have to treat and we have to be responsive to that to make sure that our plants can handle that efficiently and effectively so that we can pay for some of these other water challenges that are needed and still remain affordable to the homeowner. And so us wringing some dollars out on the energy end adds up to a more money to put towards water solutions. And I think that's an important piece for us to keep our eye on that ball as well. Is there anything anyone wants to add? Nope. Um, Extremely disappointed with some of the attitudes up here. Uh, Janine and Deborah, is there anything else that we need? I don't think so. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So I've lost my agenda, but I think that brings us to the end of um, the last thing we have on the agenda is the general manager's report. And I don't have anything further to add tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you for the presentations. This meeting.